otherwise I've not put the microphone on, have I? Oh, no, okay. Good morning, everybody. Sorry about this. I hadn't, I hadn't put the microphone on earlier on, so I'm just going to hang myself on a wire quietly. Um, good. Can everybody hear me reasonably clearly? Can everybody see the screen for the flowers? If you can't see the screen for the flowers or for me, those people on that side will have to move over to this side. And it's okay to walk around while I'm speaking. I don't get offended. Um, okay, it's kind of early in the morning. I hope you've all had plenty of coffee. Uh, I have. Uh, but I thought I would talk to you today about feet. Um, hopefully not smelly feet. Uh, but certainly messy feet because of the mess uh, that is being created uh, around us, some of the mess that you can see. Um, as I talk, this session is labeled, I think today is the International Day, if I'm right. So I'm going to try and stand back and give you sort of a global perspective on some things that are going on. Uh, without necessarily uh, being so far removed from the planet that you can't identify uh, what is happening. Uh, I think you've also had uh, or will have a session on the role of NGOs. And I work for an NGO. I work for WWF. Um, uh, so hopefully I can tie a couple of things together here uh, with other, other sessions that you've had uh, during the course of the conference. Um, so my name is Chris Hales. Uh, as you can already tell, uh, I was originally an Englishman. Um, I, I say originally an Englishman because I'm now old enough to have spent more time of my life as a foreigner in other people's countries than I ever lived in the country that I've got a passport for. Um, I'm a biologist by background. Uh, I did a degree in biology at university in Scotland. So I was born in England, but I went to Scotland um, to be educated. Anybody here from Scotland? Okay. It is true, you can get an education in Scotland, it's, <laughs> it, 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 despite what they say. I've always got to tell whether there's any Scots in the audience before I tell that joke. Um, <laughs> I did a PhD in, uh, in ornithology, in, in bird energetics. For those of you who might be ecologists, I studied energetics. I studied the energetics of reproduction in wild birds. Uh, so basically, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bird watcher who wears a jacket and speaks at conferences these days. Um, after doing that, I went uh, to teach at the University of Malaya uh, in Kuala Lumpur in, in Malaysia. Anybody here from Malaysia? Not here from Malaysia. Okay, I'm doing no Malaysian jokes. Um, because it's a lovely country and one that is very close to my heart. Um, and I was a professor of ecology at the University of Malaya for about nine years, um, uh, which is where I learned tropical biology. For a biologist to be able to go and work in the tropics is sort of like going to heaven. Well, at least it was for me. Um, and when you do it in a country with as food that's as nice as Malaysia is, then it's even more like heaven. After Malaysia, I went to Singapore. Uh, anybody from Singapore? Uh, in Singapore, I was an environmental advisor to the government for about six years. And then, after Singapore, I came here to Switzerland to work for WWF. Um, initially, as the director of the Asia Pacific program. Later, I became the global conservation director um, and now, since my beard has gone grey, uh, I do all sorts of funny things uh, that seem important to some people. Um, but WWF, and so sorry, so when you've moved around the world like that, you end up with an accent like this. So I hope you can understand what I'm saying. And all this waffle has been to give you time for your ears to adjust to my accent. Um, I work for WWF. WWF is an NGO, a non-governmental organization. We're one of those organizations that thinks we can make the world a better place, um, but we don't have any money to do that with. Um, so we have to raise the money uh, for, our, uh, for our work 
as we are actually conducting the work. Sometimes this feels a little bit like building the aeroplane whilst you're flying in it, you know? You never quite know when you're going to crash. Um, uh, WWF has never crashed. Last year we became 50 years old. Uh, so we were founded in 1961 here in Switzerland uh, as a Swiss foundation. Uh, the global headquarters is about 30 kilometers from where we stand in a little village called Glon uh, on the lake edge. Um, if you, unless you live in Switzerland, you've never heard of Glon because it's where people sleep who work in Lausanne or work in Geneva. Um, but um, I, I, if you want to know the history of WWF, we can go into it, but we'll do it later. Now, an organization like WWF basically has no right to do anything. It's a private organization. It's not part of the UN system. It has no legal rights other than the fact to be a foundation in, uh, in Switzerland. We are now uh, established also, we have a legal base in 60 countries around the world. And we run projects in more than 100 countries around the world. Um, but I emphasize this issue that we don't have any authority. We don't have any more authority than any of you have authority. And that the only way an organization like WWF can change things is by power of persuasion. By persuading people that the world will be a better place if you behave like this. The world will be a better place if this happens. Um, so this is a pretty, it's uh, not always a comfortable position to be in. Um, because I'm not boasting when I say that WWF and the little panda, there's not a little panda on the screen, so don't worry. Uh, the little panda logo that is ours um, is probably the best known brand in the environmental NGO movement. And that builds up a lot of expectations in people's minds. And, and that, those expectations I find scary because, you know, living up to those expectations and delivering what people expect um, can be really tough, uh, especially when, um, when you have no authority to do anything. Um, we are one of the best known brands in, in, in conservation um, because by comparison to other NGOs, we are a big organization. We run projects in more than 100 countries. We have um, about 5,500 employees around the world. Um, now, 5,500 sounds a lot, sounds like a multinational. Um, this time last year, I gave a presentation in Singapore uh, to one of our corporate partners, DHL, you know DHL, the delivery company, the, the people who ship little brown boxes around the world. Um, and I said, we employ five and a half thousand people around the world. And somebody said, my goodness, we employ more for DHL in Singapore than you do around the world. And that kind of puts what we're doing into perspective. Um, because we're well known, people think we are big and we're rich. Our annual conservation spend is 500 million US dollars per year. That's a lot of money. Holy cremoli, you're saying you are rich. Coca-Cola spends 2.5 billion dollars per year in marketing in North America alone. Okay? Coca-Cola, the world's largest commercial consumer of sugar, and sugar is what we call a thirsty crop, an environmentally damaging crop. Coca-Cola, where every liter of Coca-Cola, if you drink a bottle of Coca-Cola, you sure as hell better be thirsty because you're drinking 40 liters of water. That's what it takes to produce one bottle of Coca-Cola. So a company like Coca-Cola, with this one specialized product, is spending in one country five times our annual, our, our, our annual budget. So 
we've got to think of things in comparative terms. We've got to think of things, we've got to think about, well, what is the footprint of Coca-Cola on the planet? What is the impact of Coca-Cola on the planet? That they're spending this $2.5 billion advertising in order to feed our children lots of sugar. Um, uh, and, and those are the issues that, that, that we try to tackle in WWF. Uh, and those are some of the things that I want to take you into today. Um, so I've, I've already given part of the game away when I've said footprint. I think yesterday you had a lecture on the footprint of, of uh, research or something like that, right? I, I, I wasn't able to listen to that one because I was in Berlin, uh, but I, it may be the same sort of footprint that I'm talking about now. When we think of something like a Coca-Cola company, and the weight that they put on the planet, that's their footprint. That's what we call footprint. And I'll explain to you, um, I'll explain to you uh, a little bit about how we calculate that uh, during this presentation. So what I'm going to do, um, uh, I've almost finished waffling now. Uh, for about 40 minutes, I'm going to take you through uh, a presentation that tells you what is going on in the planet that determines the type of things that WWF uh, deals with? Um, the early part of it's going to be pretty depressing um, because the world's going down the tubes, we know that. Um, but I'm also going to tell you some of the solutions that we have devised that we are trying to, that we are trying to implement. So hopefully towards the end I'll give you a little bit of hope um, and you don't go out in the coffee break and, and jump in the lake or something like that. Um, are we okay? Can everybody hear? Can everybody understand? If I use a piece of jargon or, or you don't understand where I'm going, interrupt me. I don't, I don't mind. Uh, and at the end, we can have questions and answers. Is that right, Julie? We can have a discussion. Yeah, okay. Um, <coughs> what I'm going to tell you today is based upon a publication that we put out in WWF every two years, which is called the Living Planet Report. At the end, on the final slide, I'll give you a hot link where you can download a free version of it. The Living Planet Report we produce uh, every two years, as I say, uh, because we, it takes us two years to do the calculations, and some of the trends that we talk about don't change every year. Um, but we, we first invented this in the late 90s, and we wanted it to be sort of our Dow Jones, uh, FTSE, CAC 40, whatever is your Nikkei favorite index of the economy. We wanted to see if we could come up with an index of the environment. And that index of the environment we call the Living Planet Index. The Living Planet Index, like all the economic indicators in the world today, is going down and has declined 28% since 1970. Now, in order to understand <coughs> why that index, the environmental index, has gone down, we also work with something we call the ecological footprint, which is going in the opposite direction. The ecological footprint is going up. This is one case where something going up is not good news, it's bad news. Um, we also find in the Living Planet Report that it is the poorest countries of the world that are bearing the brunt of these trends. Declining nature, increasing human impact. And I'll show you that. And the solutions lie in all of us making better choices. And when I say all of us, I go all the way from individuals to governments through, through businesses. Um, so let's talk about footprint first. Let's talk about the ecological footprint. As I said, the ecological footprint is all to do with the weight that human activity puts on the planet. Um, if, you're, uh, if you imagine yourself walking along the seashore as the tide is going out when the sand is wet, um, if you're a substantive sort of a guy like me, you leave a big footprint in the, in the sand. Uh, if you're a sliver of a girl like Julie, uh, you don't leave, you leave much less of a footprint uh, uh, than I would do. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's weight on the planet. 
And some years ago, we said, is there some way that all our activity, all our travel, all our construction, all our consumption, is there some way that we can figure out what, how to measure that impact on the planet? Um, we were fortunate. We, we, we had a few experiments ourselves within WWF. We weren't very good at this. Um, but there was a, a Swiss gentleman by the name of Mathis Wackenagel who did a PhD in the, in the 90s called The Ecological Footprint, who had formed an NGO of his own called the Global Footprint Network, who was doing exactly what we wanted to do. So WWF and Global Footprint Network today have a partnership uh, where we work through the ecological footprint. Now, to calculate the ecological footprint, and it's, it, it, it's not straightforward to look at human impact on the planet in a quantitative and comparative way, we look at what, is, what are our types of activity uh, that demand resources from the planet, and how could we turn this activity into a set of numbers that somehow were comparative. Um, we, we looked at... Uh, uh, we looked at the amount of land we need for our cities, the amount of water we need to be able to catch the fish that we eat, the forest areas that we need to be able to, to provide the world's supplies of, of timber, the, the arable land, the fields that we need to feed cattle, to feed our sheep and goats, uh, the meat that we consume, the fields that we need for all the crops, all the vegetables, all the cereals that we, that we eat. What area of that do we need? And finally, we wanted to look at carbon. How do we, how do we measure that gas that we put into the atmosphere uh, to, be, to know uh, what demands that is placing on the planet? Uh, to look at carbon, uh, we actually um, don't look at the gas itself we look at the vegetation that would be required to reabsorb that gas that we put into the atmosphere every year. So how many, how many hectares of forest would we need to be able to resorb, uh, uh, to resorb that particular pollutant? Uh, and that way, by looking at all of these in, a, in an area term, uh, we can calculate the area that we all require uh, uh, to live on the planet. Um, we get the data for this from, from the databases that the UN system compiles um, I, I, in terms of trade. Uh, uh, um, countries report to the UN, report to the World Trade Organization and things like that. Uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, their annual productivity of food their trade in commodities uh, across the world. So from these figures that governments themselves uh, compile, uh, we can calculate the areas needed uh, for all this, type of, uh, all this type of activity. So I emphasize these are not our numbers, these are numbers that countries themselves uh, come up with. Um, we looked in these databases and back calculated to 1960 uh, for uh, all these different uh, resources uh, and the area that they needed. And so this is the area of vegetation for carbon. The yellow is the area of crops, grazing land, forest, water for our fish. And finally, that little orange sliver at the top is the built-up land, the area of land that we need for our cities and our roads uh, and, and so on. Uh, so a few things that you can see, a few things that you can see in this, this overwhelming slug of carbon down here, the carbon footprint, and we'll come back to that uh, later on. It also is interesting to see the tiny, tiny footprint of our cities. We think of cities as... It's these huge, horrible concrete things, right? Uh, but in actual fact, in terms of an ecological footprint, the, 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 the land that we construct on is not as great as we might anticipate it to be. Um, on this graph, this scale up the side here is 
the number of planets, if we take our planet Earth, it has the ability to produce a certain amount. It depends on rain and sunshine and the latitude that you live at. Um, and so this is, this is one planet and the capacity of the Earth to meet all these different requirements. So another key thing that you can see in this is that in 1961, we were using just a little bit over half of the planet. And slowly but surely, let me simplify this. If we just look at this top line uh, now, uh, if we, in 1961, we were using about just over half uh, of the bio capacity of our planet. And that has grown. It's grown over the years. It's grown over the years because, of course, human population has grown, so there's more people consuming more stuff. Um, but also, our lifestyles have got a lot richer and a lot more consumptive as well, so our footprint uh, has got heavier. Uh, sometime in the 1970s, we don't really know when, uh, but sometime in the 1970s, we passed the carrying capacity of the planet, the biocapacity of the, of the one planet, uh, and it continues to grow until today we are using the natural resources of about one and a half planets. Um, so now you're saying to yourself, this guy's crazy, he didn't drink enough coffee this morning. How can we use one and a half planets worth of resources when we've only got one planet uh, to live on? Think of it a little bit. I know you're all students, but you all live on something. You all have a, an allowance of some description coming from somewhere. Uh, and you've got a bank account, I guess. Each month, hopefully, you're able to put some money into that bank account. And I know definitely you're taking money out of that bank account. Um, if you put in more money than you take out, your capital will grow. If you take out more money than you put in, your capital will shrink. And I'm sure I've been a student too, that some of you are facing a situation where you're pretty close to zero or below zero. And it'll get better, that's all I can say. It will get better, I promise you. Um, but um, so, so think of the resources of the planet in the same way as the money in your bank account. We can spend more than we earn. We cut down trees in the forest faster than they can grow. We take fish out of the sea faster than they can reproduce. We accumulate our pollutants in the environment faster than the natural systems of the planet can recycle them. Um, so, so this is what we are doing. We are running down the natural capital of the planet. We're spending... This, we're spending the stuff that we've got in the bank in, our, in, in, in the nature of our planet faster than it can uh, regenerate. Um, I said that uh, we calculate the ecological footprint based on statistics given to us by different countries. And you can now begin to imagine what that database might look like, okay? Uh, these are all the countries for which we've got data. There's, there's about 150 there. Uh, not every country in the world uh, can we get data for. Um, and for each country, we can calculate uh, the, the, the footprint of the, the, different, uh, the different activities. Uh, across the middle here, now, this is the, this scale, this time, is actually what we call global hectares. We have to recalculate this data according to the country because the productivity of temperate countries and tropical countries differs. So we use different figures in the database to calculate how many hectares is required. If we average across the planet the capacity, the biocapacity, and divide it by the human population, it turns out that we all get about 2.2 hectares of the planet that, that we have to live on. So you get 2.2 hectares, you get 2.2 hectares, I get 2.2 hectares, right? And I'm supposed to, if I'm sustainable, live within that 2.2 hectares. And that's 2.2 hectares there. 
Each of these bars is all the countries of the world and how many hectares per person those countries are actually using. You can't read the countries on this slide. You're going to have to download the Living Planet Report to, to have a look in detail. But you can see the big ones at this end are using, what, somewhere between five, four and five times their allowance. And uh, in here, uh, we've got some of the Middle Eastern countries like uh, the UAE. Uh, I think Kuwait is in there. We've got the United States. Uh, we've got many European countries at, at, this, end of the, at this end of the scale. Uh, at this end of the scale, down here, we have the poorest countries of the world. We have those countries which are closest to their resources, and I'm going to go into some of the trends uh, for that uh, in a little while. So this is how we can put all this together, and this is how we can tease out just what is happening. Um, just to show you the direction that we're heading in, this was, the, this was back calculating to 1961, the ecological footprint uh, of all the countries of the world. Um, and the, the deeper the red color, the, 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 the bigger, the heavier the footprint. Uh, and the pale countries there are actually living within their carrying capacity for their country. And the darker the color, the more you exceed the carrying capacity of your country. That was 61. That was 2008. Okay, so you can see what is happening here is that more and more countries of the world are beginning to exceed the capacity of their countries to, to sustain themselves. Is this necessarily a bad thing? It's not necessarily a bad thing. Not everybody has to live within their borders because we can trade food, we can trade commodities across the world. The important thing is that we shouldn't be exceeding the total capacity of the planet to sustain us. And that's what we're doing. Now, why, do we, why, why does this happen? Well, I told you earlier on that it's, that, that it's a, a mixture of human population size and the amount of stuff that that population consumes. Um, so we've got, two, we've got two patterns here that are important in the ecological footprint. How many people? What kind of lifestyle? Let's deal with the how many people stuff, first of all. This is a curve of the of the uh, growth of human population since 1950, uh, when we were around about 3 billion people, uh, to today, uh, where we're 7 billion people. And the projections are that we're going to level off uh, sometime in the middle of this century, around about 9 or 10 billion. Um, but that growth is not the same across all the world. <coughs> and that is important. The pink curve here is the population growth in Africa. The yellow is Asia, Europe, Latin America, North America, and there's a little green line there you can hardly see that is the oceanic uh, countries of the world. So you can see, as we know, that in North America and Europe, um, uh, and, and Latin America, interestingly, we could always go back and discuss that, um, Population growth is rather, is rather small. In Asia, population growth is huge. Uh, and in Africa, is catching up to the Asia proportions, but is still going to continue to grow uh, well beyond into the, next, into the next century. As the population grows, uh, this is where the danger point comes. Um, this is a funny map of the world that we've drawn using circles to, uh, to describe urbanization. How many people living in cities? I said earlier on that those cities, the area we need for our cities, is actually relatively small compared to everything else. But it's what goes on in those cities that is important. Because it's in cities where people are living that high consumptive lifestyles take place. It's cities that need water supplies, that need energy supplies, that need food supplies, that draw on their hinterland, uh, and the hinterland has to be able to produce those resources. 
So the more people you're living, who are living in cities, the greater your challenges are of reaching a sustainable lifestyle because we run into issues of transport and uh, all those types of things. Um, the, trend, the trend around the world is not equal. Um, we find that in, in, in the developed world, uh, we tend to have a higher proportion of people living in cities than in developing countries. This is because there's just that much less rural behavior. Agriculture has become industrialized with large machineries. We farm prairies. We don't sm farm small holdings anymore. Um, and so fewer people live in the country. P fewer people live in, in rural areas. More people live in cities. Uh, so in the US, for example, we've got 81%. In Germany, 75. In France, 77. In the UK, I can't really see that number. Is it 80% there in the UK? Um, whereas in developing countries, the proportion, all these, all these pictures are all in the Living Planet Report, so you can, uh, when you download it, you can see them yourself. Um, uh, in, in developing countries, the smaller uh, uh, proportion, even in China, now China, has got the largest urban population of any country in the world, 559 million. But on, that's only 42% of people in China uh, who are living in cities. Um, the US has got 81%, but because there's fewer people in the US, it's only 246 million people, billion people, sorry. Um, India, uh, there's 329 million people living in cities, but again, that is less than 30% of the population of India. Now, as, as these countries grow, as these countries get more industrialized, as these countries get wealthier, what we're seeing is a migration of people from rural areas into those cities. So cities are going to increase in size tremendously uh, during the rest of this century. And as those cities grow, they're going to be putting more, uh, more pressure, a greater ecological footprint on the planet. Uh, this, is just a, this is just a diagram that shows the average household footprint uh, of different countries of the world. This is the United States uh, uh, at the top here. Uh, and the average household in Russia, Brazil, South Africa, China, Indonesia, India. And what we're going to see, these are, of course, mostly the BRICS countries here, what we call the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, which are the most rapidly growing economies in the world. As these economies grow, people get wealthier. As people get wealthier, their consumption goes up. I mean, typically what we see is as people's income grows, the first thing they do is feed their families better. Higher quality food, more protein in the diet. House their families better. People buy cars, people buy televisions, people people get more and more white goods, which are all then demanding energy. So the footprint with wealth goes up. Now, I'm not saying people do not have a right to get wealthier. People do not, people do have a right. People do have a right to improve their quality of life uh, for their families and for future generations. The challenge is how can we do that? How can we help people improve their livelihoods without wrecking the planet that we depend upon. So let me, t let me go into now what is happening on the planet. Keep in mind that stuff on the ecological footprint. I now want to take you to what we call a living planet index, which is our Dow Jones of the, uh, of the environment. We calculate the living planet index. Well, no, let me tell you the trend first. Um, like all indices, we also take this back to a, a number one. Uh, and this is just a mathematical, hypothetical one, okay? Um, in 1970. Until 2008, which is the latest year that we have a data set for, we find a gradual progression of decline of about 30%. So this is the natural capital of our planet that has declined by about a third uh, over the last uh, uh, 40 years. Uh, for those of you who are statisticians, 
the, the blue lines, the wider blue lines there are the standard deviation. So you can see that this is a significant trend in this data. We gather this data by looking at species, wild species that scientists have studied and where they've published their surveys of those species, those populations, in peer-reviewed data. So this data in peer-reviewed journals. So this data, all the data in here is not gathered by WWF, it's gathered by scientists all over the world who have carried out a count of a wild species population and have done it well enough to have it published in a scientific journal. Um, we, we look for data that tells us trends. So we need at least three data points to know whether something is, is going up or going down. Most of our data is drawn from vertebrates, those organisms with a spine, those organisms with a, with a backbone. So here, for example, is survey data of bluefin tuna in the, in the Western Atlantic, uh, with data which goes back to 71, and the trend of a bluefin tuna is pretty, pretty clear. Uh, this is the trend of, a Euro of European otters. Uh, we only have data going back to 1984 uh, for these otters, but the, the trend is going up as conservation has taken a grip within Europe. People have got interested in the conservation of otters. Uh, and so uh, th their numbers have gone up. This is a wandering albatross in the Southern Ocean, and some years they seem to go up, some years they seem to go down. Uh, but generally, the trend is, is downwards. Um, this is, these are freshwater dolphins uh, from around the world. There are dolphins that ri live in rivers. Uh, these are often blind, and they use a sonar system to navigate, so they're interesting creatures. Um, and we can see that, uh, well, the, the baiji in China uh, now we believe is extinct. We don't think there are any, any left, and that is something that's gone extinct quite quickly since I began working for WWF, actually. Uh, this is the Irrawaddy dolphin from Southeast Asia, the Ganges dolphin from the Ganges River, the Amazon dolphins, which seem to be doing better than some of these others, and the Indus dolphin, which has actually increased over recent years. Now, within the Living Planet uh, Index, we have about 25,000 data sets like this drawn from 9,000 different species. So we've got a big mass of data, which gives us the trend of a reduction of 30% uh, that I told you about. It also gives us enough data that we can start to say, well, are these are things, different things going on in different parts of the world? Um, we, can, we can differentiate between those species sets in the tropics and those species sets in temperate regions. And if we calculate separate indices for those in different parts of the world, we can see that in temperate regions of the world, the Living Planet Index has actually gone up by 31%. Whereas in the tropics, the Living Planet Index has gone down by twice as much as the global average. It's gone down by 61%. What does this mean? Uh, does it mean that everything is fine in, in temperate regions? No, it doesn't. Because it's, it, this is a bit of an artifact of the fact that we go back to 1970. Because most of the temperate regions covers most of the industrialized countries of the world. And the industrialized countries of the world started industrializing somewhere between 150 and 200 years ago. So it was way back before anybody was counting anything that the destruction of natural environments was, was taking place. Um, and so if we could calculate this back 200 years, we'd probably find the temperate curve should be up here somewhere, actually. Um, and what I think is happening here is that the declines have already taken place. The destruction has already happened. Um, I mean, just to give you an idea of the scale here, right? I, I come from Britain. Uh, there is almost no natural forest left at all in Britain. I went to university in Scotland, which is famous for the, for the moorlands on the mountains, these beauty, beautiful heather landscapes. That's not natural. That's not natural. Those mountains had forests on them 300 years ago. Those forests were all cut down by the English to build ships to go off and colonize the rest of the world. 
And the forests that weren't cut down uh, were deliberately destroyed in the genocide that the English carried out against the Scots to suppress these tribes from the north, right? But those bare mountains that we value so much these days, they should really be forests, but people have forgotten about that. Um, so this is what I say, that this curve should actually be going up here. What we are seeing here, I'm sure, uh, is the fact that conservation has been developing um, in industrialized countries, and it's a, a sociological phenomenon, if you like. Um, and so there has been a recovery uh, within places like Europe and North America in some species. But it is the tropical part of the world where the pressure is greatest. The tropical part of the world, uh, which is now at the stage that the industrial countries were at over here, where the greatest amount of destruction is taking place. Um, now, that destruction, um, I've talked about species and I've talked about conservation but it can have much more fundamental and profound effects on people's lifestyles than simply whether otters are declining or rising, whether dolphins are declining or rising. Um, if, you, if, we look at, um, if we look at high income, middle income and low income countries uh, for the living planet index, this is the state of nature, as I've said, high-income countries, uh, pretty, pretty flat, pretty, pretty stable uh, in the state of nature. Middle-income countries declining, but it's the poorest countries of the world that are declining the fastest. And remember, I said that it is the, in the poorest countries of the world where people are still living closest to their resources, where people are still dependent upon nature uh, for their daily livelihoods and their security of their families. And yet this is where we are losing nature the fastest. Not necessarily because of those people, although p people activities and population growth are aggravating it, but also because of some of the uh, other things going on that I'll take you to in a moment. But couple that decline of nature with also what the ecological footprint is telling us. So let's go back to the ecological footprint for a little while and let's look at the ecological footprint in those three same categories of countries, of high income, middle income and low income countries. High income countries, well first of all we can see the high income countries have got an ecological footprint way beyond anybody else, right? Because this is where the consumption is taking place. High income countries went through a very rapid growth uh, up to about 1970. Around about 1970 was when the first oil crisis hit the world and when people began to think about resource constraints. And since the 1970s, high-income countries have been fairly flat, but still very high. Middle-income countries poodled along and are now seeing a rise in recent years. But my concern is with the poor-income countries, the low-income countries, you can't really see it on this scale, but their, eco their ecological footprint has declined by about 3% over the time frame that we're looking at here. Is that a good thing, that ecological footprint is going down in the low-income countries? No, it's not. Because if you look, nature is declining in those countries people's abilities to consume are going down in those countries. So when you hear uh, on telly or read in the newspaper about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, here is the evidence using ecological data from an environmental organization that underpins that. And those trends lead us into all sorts of, all sorts of problems. And problems that manifest themselves all over the place. Does it matter? Yes, it does matter, and I want to talk to you a little bit about why it matters and about what we can do about it. Uh, this is a beautiful picture uh, uh, taken from a, a satellite. It's a picture of the Aral Sea uh, in Central Asia. 
Um, the Aral Sea, like the Caspian Sea, you've probably seen pictures of the Caspian Sea uh, uh, with, uh, uh, that is drying out. The Aral Sea is also drying out. It is drying out because the countries of Central Asia are redirecting the rivers that flow into the Aral Sea and using the water for agricultural irrigation. A lot of that agricultural irrigation is for cot cotton, which is a crop that requires a lot of water and which gives us our shirts, right? Um, the Aral Sea was shrinking at such a rate that people have actually built a dam across the middle of it to try and preserve some of the water in the northern part and have given up on the southern part. I mean, this is, this is environmental engineering on a huge scale. And so what we're seeing here is is the drying out of an inland sea. And these white areas are huge, huge salt, salt flats that are developing as the water evaporates. And these are enormous. There's something like 40,000 square kilometers of salt flats there. When the wind blows, as it does in Central Asia, uh, the salts and the minerals from these flats get picked up. They get carried out. Uh, they affect human health. And those salts are also de deposited upon farmland and reduce the, the fertility uh, of the farmland. So we've got ecological experiments on here. We're redirecting the water. We're trying to grow more stuff. We're destroying the lake. The lake is producing salts which grow back on the farmland, which then uh, require more irrigation to try and make it more fertile again. And, and this is a downward, a downward spiral. Um, but I want to take you, since this is an international setting, I want to take you to uh, a part of the world that not all of you will be that familiar with, and that is Southeast Asia, where I spent the first part of my career, uh, and which is still very close to my heart. And I just want to take you through some of the things that are going on in this region, this region of very rapidly expanding uh, economies. Uh, this is a slide of some of the programs that my organization has running uh, in, this, in this region. This region is uh, an area of high human population density, high growth rate, high economic uh, development as well. Uh, this, takes its, this takes its toll. This is a, a map of forest cover uh, in the region in 2000 uh, and the projection of forest cover uh, in 2050. Um, these changes can be quite dramatic. If this is going to work. This is, this is the island of Borneo and the rate of forest loss over the years uh, in, in Borneo. Uh, Borneo is a, a country that is divided between Malaysia. This is Sarawak. This is Sabah. This southern part of the island belongs to Indonesia. Uh, and little Brunei is these two, these two blobs here. We have a program that we call the Heart of Borneo. The Heart of Borneo is this green area that we think will be all that's left of the forests by 2020. Let's go through those slides again. So this is how it was. In, this is forest cover in 1900, 1950, 1985, 2000, 2010 and the projection to 2020. And you can see how the forests are being eaten away. The consequence of this removal of forests has quite profound effects on a lot of things. It not only affects the people, the indigenous people who depend upon those forests, the hunter-gatherers who live there, it affects the quality of water that runs off those hills and the people who depend upon that water uh, further downstream. As forests erode, it depends, it, it, it influences uh, soil fertility. Um, but as we now know in recent years, as those forests are removed, as they rot and as they burn, it also contributes to climate change because those forests are made out of carbon. And when a forest burns, that carbon is released into the atmosphere. And we now know that about 17% of the problem of climate change is caused by forest uh, destruction. Um, 
We asked ourselves a few years ago, is it possible to take timber out of forests like those of Borneo? Because uh, a lot of trees there grow very slowly. The timber, when it grows slowly, when a tree grows slowly, it gives very, very hard timber. And that timber is beautiful looking timber that we like to put on our desks and our furniture and the panels on our walls and ceilings and build our buildings out of because it's very tough. Um, but if we take the trees out of the forest faster than they can grow, then we're destroying the forest. A few years ago, we said, well, could we actually take timber out of a forest, calculate, calculate how fast that forest is growing and harvest timber sustainably? In other words, can we take money out of the bank at the same rate that nature is replacing it? And we found that you could. The, comp the calculations are complex. They differ according to which country of the world you are dealing with and the type of trees that you're dealing with. But we put together something that we call the Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, Forest Stewardship Council. It has a little logo, which is this tree uh, with a little tick on it. And when you see that logo on a piece of wood, it is a guarantee that that piece of wood has come from a forest that is sustainably managed. So what we've been looking at is can we certify wood, timber, in this way, uh, and keep that certification attached to that piece of wood all the way along the supply chain, because each of these pieces of wood, you know, it gets cut down, it gets cut into planks, it gets put on a ship, it gets exported to Europe. In Europe, an importer buys it, they cut it into smaller pieces, they turn it into door frames, they turn it into window frames, and it appears in somebody's house. We want to make that entire supply chain sustainable. And so what we have done is put together the Forest Stewardship Council, which is a certification system, um, which is now independent of WWF. And we want people to buy that timber in favor of timber which is not certified. So if we can give a market edge to certified timber, we can let capitalism save the forests in the heart of Borneo. And so now we have a system where forests all over the world are certified in this way. Uh, and here in Switzerland, you can go to Ikea just down the road. No, I think it's down the road that way. Uh, and buy uh, a piece of furniture with an FSC logo on it. We can go in Switzerland to the Migros supermarket and buy charcoal for our summer barbecues, which has got the FSC logo on it. Trees are also used to make paper for pulp. So we can go to stationery stores and we can buy paper for our computer printers that has got the FSC logo on it. So slowly but surely, this logo is penetrating many different parts of the, of the market. But those forests are not just being uh, destroyed because of timber. They're also being destroyed because of this stuff, which is palm oil. Uh, now, palm oil is, is a, a magical substance, and the, the oil palm tree, which is actually an African species, comes out of West Africa, uh, but thrives very, very well in tropical Southeast Asia, and is grown in huge plantations. Now, those plantations exist where a tropical forest used to exist. There is a huge, huge growing demand for palm oil. It's nutritious, it's rich in calories, it's rich in carbon, it can be mixed with all sorts of other chemicals and turned into all sorts of products that we all use on a daily basis. And you'll see campaigns that say no palm oil, we should... We should ban palm oil. We should not ever consume anything that contains palm oil. But if any of you had a shower this morning, which I think is probably most of you, um, you used palm oil. If you used shampoo, if you used a gel, if you used a bar of soap, if you cleaned your teeth with toothpaste, and if that was a plastic toothbrush with some bristles in it, you used palm oil already today. And it is impossible uh, to avoid using palm oil. And even if we could get so sophisticated in a place like Switzerland that we banned any product with oil palm in it, most of the palm oil from Southeast Asia is being consumed in India and China. It's not being consumed uh, in Asia. 
in, in Europe. So what we're doing now is applying that same theory for the Forest Stewardship Council to palm oil. We've got together the palm oil companies and we said, can we define best practice for the production of palm oil? Can we define how we can produce palm oil without too much waste, without excessive use of pesticides, without burning the forest, without burning the old palm oil trees when they are, uh, when they are past maturity? so that we can get as close to being sustainable as possible. It's not going to be completely sustainable. That used to be a forest, right? So, you know, the forest had to go before it went there, b b before you grow the palm oil. But maybe we can reduce the ecological footprint of palm oil production to the minimum possible, so that we can still utilize palm oil for all the reasons that we all utilize it, without uh, being too damaging. And this sort of takes us into a bit of a gray area because there is still a certain amount of environmental decline associated with it, but what we're now doing is minimizing. And this is a, this is a very controversial program uh, that we're involved with, uh, and we have been criticized for it. Um, but it's not just on the land uh, that the problems exist. I said earlier on, when we were talking about natural capital, um, that it's also uh, taking place within the sea. And the, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization tells us that 80% of the world's fish stocks uh, are fully exploited or uh, overfished. Um, so applying this same logic, could we figure out a way of taking fish out of the sea at the same rate that they are reproducing at the same rate that those populations are, are growing. And we've done quite a bit of work of this in an area that we call the Coral Triangle. The Coral Triangle in Southeast Asia is important. Uh, if I was to start off, if I was to be in, a, in, in, in the, uh, the west coast of North America, right over here somewhere, and come across the Pacific Ocean surveying the, surveying the corals, I would find that coral diversity and fish diversity gets bigger and bigger and bigger until when I arrive in the Coral Triangle in Southeast Asia, I'm in the richest coral seas of the world. So these seas are important. But these seas are also the home to millions of people who depend upon the fish that are in there. These seas are also the breeding grounds of Tudor, who likes to eat sushi. These, these are also the breeding grounds of tuna that feed the sushi restaurants in, uh, in Japan and all across, all across Asia. And a lot of the fish out of these seas are not just eaten by the local communities, they're exported to all those rapidly growing economies like Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, Thailand. Um, that sheer demand for species is leading people into very bad fishing practices. This, uh, this gentleman uh, is from the Philippines, and he is using uh, something that we call cyanide fishing. Uh, he's got a pretty primitive pair of goggles. This is a hose uh, that takes him back to the surface, to a little canoe on the surface so that he can still breathe. Uh, and in his hand here, he's got an old squeezy bottle that has got cyanide solution in it, which he is squirting around this coral head here, and the cyanide stuns the fish. The fish float to the surface. You can take a net. His companion in the canoe can take a net and scoot them off the surface. Uh, those fish, if they're dead, they go to the market. If they're still alive, they're kept in tanks. They can go to the seafood restaurants. They can grow. Uh, this can be fresh fish in the seafood restaurants for the clients to go and sell. But that cyanide drifts all around in the water, killing all sorts of other things. And this coral head here is undoubtedly killed uh, as a consequence of this. But this is, all due to, this is all due to market pressure. And these kind of pressures... Uh, are seeing a huge, showing us a huge decline uh, in fish stocks. 
There are other effects of this fishing pressure. This is a turtle uh, which is caught up in an abandoned fishing net um, from, a, from a trawler. Uh, and this turtle drowned uh, as a consequence of, of being caught up in the net because it, no uh, it could no longer swim. When you're catching tuna, you're using long lines, a long line with hooks on it. Um, and uh, those lines can be 20 kilometers long. With a, fish, with a fish hook every 20 or 30 meters along it. Thousands of fish hooks uh, with bait on them. Those, that bait often attracts turtles again uh, to, 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 to eat the bait. And the turtle gets caught up in the hook uh, because it, uh, it catches in the throat. We ran a competition for the type of gear that can reduce this type of phenomenon, which is called bycatch. And somebody came up with this idea that we call a J hook. This is a, this is a, a round, sorry, a circle hook. This is a rounded hook, which is just as efficient at catching fish, but can go down the throat of a turtle and come out again without snagging because it's got this very, very round surface. And this type of hook has proved to be immensely popular. We've distributed it now to fishermen in Latin America to fishermen in Indonesia and the Philippines, because these fishermen don't like catching turtles either. It's a pain in the neck. You've got a, this heavy thing coming over the side of the boat. You've got to try and get your hook back. Maybe your line breaks. You've got this big, heavy beast in the boat that you've then got to throw away because you don't want it anyway. This is, this, these types of activities are extremely uh, damaging. And so what we do is take away the old-fashioned J-hook, and give people these circle hooks, which are just as good at catching fish, a lot better for the fishermen, they're very popular, and reduce the amount uh, of bycatch. But we also wanted to look at that demand for those big fisheries. Could we take the lesson from the Forest Stewardship Council and invent the same thing for the fish? So we invented, we're well not awfully original, the Marine Stewardship Council. So now we've got the FS, we had the FSC, uh, now we've got something called the MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council, and the logo of the Marine Stewardship Council is a little fish, and guess what, in the shape of a tick. And that's telling you this fish is okay. This fish has been taken from a stock in a sustainable manner. Now it's much harder to come up with a scheme like this for fish than it is for uh, timber, because fish are difficult to count. When you look at the surface of the water, that's all you see. Uh, fish are hard to see. So it needs good ecology, good science, knowledge of those fish stocks, and it also requires a certain amount of policing, inspectors on boats to look at the rate that fish are being taken out, inspectors on the dockside uh, to be able to uh, verify a catch when it is being brought uh, to the port. Uh, but if we can do this, if we can do this, then we can stop those trends in overfishing. And today, here in Switzerland, I can go to the supermarket and I can buy a fish with this little logo, this little FSC logo, uh, on either the package, if it's a frozen fish, or at the fishmonger's council, uh, counter. Um, so these are the experiments that we have underway in meeting human demands in a sustainable way. Uh, this curve here is the growth of the Forest Stewardship Council, which started back here somewhere. This curve is the Marine Stewardship Council. So what we're talking about here is percentage of market share over the years. Um, this are our more recent experiments with the oil palm industry and certifying palm oil. A um, few trends here that are interesting. It took us ages to get the FSC off the ground, but now it's growing. We learned from those lessons. The Marine Stewardship Council grew faster, and now the oil palm one, if it's going to work, is growing even faster still. So it looks as though we're getting better at understanding the market forces that can be used in the favor uh, of the environment. There's another story in here, is that changing human behavior uh, when it comes to resources is a long job. This is 2000 to 2011, that's a 10 year, that's a 10 year graph. 
we started the Forest Stewardship Council around about 1990. When we start doing these jobs, we're in it for the long haul. You can't think that it's behavior that can be changed in one or two years. We're talking about decades. We're talking about 10 years, 20 years at changing human behavior, being able to provide people with the things that they want uh, sustainably, and having them knowledgeable enough to be able to consume it. So that's, that's sort of humans, market forces, and supply chains. The final story I want to tell you today is at a bigger scale. And so it's good to start the picture with a big fish. This is a Mekong catfish. Is there anybody here from anywhere near the Mekong? Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos? Where are you from? From Hanoi, okay, so you're, you're Vietnamese. So the Mekong is no stranger to you. Maybe you've even seen a Mekong catfish, have you? Okay, the Mekong River is an amazing river. It's thousands of kilometers long, maybe 3,000 kilometers long. It rises in Tibet, there's a little stream. Uh, it flows across deserts, it flows through, uh, it flows through fl plains and forests. Uh, in Cambodia, it swells out into a huge lake that changes shape according to the monsoon seasons and ends up uh, in uh, the South China Sea. It is a river that has been stable for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. This stability, this reliability of flow, and the variety of uh, habitats that the river flows through has meant that evolution has taken its course in the Mekong like few other rivers in the world. And so this catfish, in Europe our catfish are about this big, this catfish is the result of millions of years of evolution. Uh, this is a, a freshwater ray from the Mekong River. I'm told this is a fairly small specimen because it's only about two meters across. I'm told they can grow to five meters across. Uh, I mean, this is just, these are phenomena uh, of nature. I mean, just absolutely incredible. But um, those, that same river that has produced those fish is also the world's largest inland fishery with 60 million people who are dependent upon reliable fish stocks for their protein supplies to be able to take the fish out of that river. Um, that river also provides nutrients to people who live downstream. Uh, and this is, the, this is the Mekong River here. This is the Mekong Delta. Uh, silt is brought down that river. Um, where, where, where our delegate sits in Hanoi is much further uh, in the north up there. But you can see here where the delta develops, this brown curve is the silt that is being brought downriver and uh, going out into the sea. Much of that silt is deposited in the delta, and that silt provides the nutrients to the farmers who live there, uh, many growing rice, and you can just see here a pattern of irrigation canals. So you can, this is from a satellite, right? So you can get an idea of the scale of rice growing there. But also that silt prevents salt water from coming back upstream and destroying the fertility of the land. So that silt is really important to the people down there. It's their fertilizer and it's their protection against the sea. So here we can see the full length of the Mekong from where it rises in Tibet, flows all the way down uh, here to the delta that I just showed you there. Each of these dams, e sorry, each of these yellow spots is a dam, a dam that is being constructed across the river. And um, those dams are being constructed to provide hydropower, to provide electricity uh, for people in the region. Uh, and you can see here, this is a satellite photo taken at night of the region. You can see where that electricity is burning, okay? So here is, here is the coast of Vietnam with the, the Mekong River coming down through here. 
One, the first thing you can see is that that area of Laos and Cambodia, uh, I guess this must be Hanoi up there. This is probably Phnom Penh or, or Ho Chi Minh down here, is it? Which, it's Ho Chi Minh, is it, down here? Uh, this is Bangkok, this big spidery thing. Uh, this is Singapore, this bright dot. This line here is the line of civilization that connects Bangkok with Kuala Lumpur and, and Singapore along the line of the highways and the, and the railway lines. What else have we got? Look at Taiwan, look at Japan. Wow, at night, amazing. Um, so those hydro dams that are being built on the Mekong apparently are not actually providing electricity to the countries of the region. They're being exported to other countries around, right? Because this area is mostly black. Thailand is mostly white. So a lot of that electricity is going uh, to Thailand. When you build a hydro dam, you're going to say, well, a hydro dam is a good thing, right? Because it's not a coal-fired power station and it's not an oil thing. Hydropower is good. It's clean. Well, when you build a hydropower dam, you build something like this. Uh, you put a barrier across a, a narrow neck of the river. You construct a huge, this creates a huge lake behind it. Now, this should be a river, right? So what do you do? Suddenly, you create a lake. You completely change the ecological conditions there. The things that live in the river can no longer live in the lake. You block up the water, and then you squeeze it at high pressure through these little holes and generate electricity whilst it goes through there. But what happens to the stability of that river? What happens to the silt that it was carrying? What happens to the species that were in there? You basically have to start all over again at the bottom here with a dead river and repeat it. And maybe 50 kilometers downstream, there's another dam. So these dams, they trap the silt, they destroy the species, they completely change the face of, uh, uh, of the river. Now, you're going to say to me, well, what do you want? The world needs energy. You're telling us we can't burn coal. You can't, you're telling us we shouldn't burn oil. Now you're telling us we can't make electricity uh, with water. Uh, so what are we supposed to do? Live by candlelight? Well, no. We've got to make better choices. Here is a plan that our team in Vietnam has developed for the type of hydropower that could be developed on the Mekong River whilst keeping the river alive. And instead of building that colossal big dam, for the same cost, you could dig out a side channel like this, where you have one set of electricity generation here, another set of electricity generation down here. You can still have the wild river, the natural river flowing down the middle, allowing all those species, all those fish stocks that people are dependent upon to be consistent, allowing the silt to continue to flow downstream to those farmers who live uh, in the delta, and you can still generate electricity. And you can build dozens, tens of these uh, these types of channels for the same cost of one of those massive dams, but you are maintaining the ecology of that river intact. So, it's all about better choices. It's all about better choices of how we live our lives. What do we consume? Is there an FSC logo on that new bed that you bought last week? When you go buy your fish, is there an MSC logo on it? When, you when you're consuming things, do we really need to buy that? Do we really need the latest iPod? Or is a two-year-old iPod just as good and sounds just the same? These are the decisions that we've got to make. We can still improve livelihoods. We can still improve people's wealth. We can still have our children living a better life than we had without wrecking the planet. But it's not always a shortcut. Sometimes it's a long journey. Sometimes it needs a little sacrifice. But it doesn't mean that we all have to live with candlelight. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I promised you a link to the Living Planet Report. Uh, this is the WWF website, uh, panda.org. 
Uh, and if you go on there and just put LPR 2012 in the search pane, uh, you can download the Living Planet report there in several different languages and choose the one you're most comfortable with. So thank you very much. Okay, so is there any question for Mr. Hills? Please raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, please say your name and the country you're from. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the uh, clear explanation. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh, I, I'm going to ask about the last hopes, the last phase of your explanation. I really appreciate for that. Yeah, the, the choice are, sorry, I didn't say my name. My name is Afona Chernet from uh, representing Japan, um, Hokkaido uh, University, the north part of uh, uh, Japan. So my question is on the last phase of your uh, presentation, which uh, you have uh, given us on the three options of uh, the FSC, MSC, and uh, also the last phase on the uh, uh, river. So in this case, how, is, how do you expect the cost, I mean the initial cost? Like it might be uh, difficult for, for most of us, like human beings, we choose the short path. We don't see the, uh, the, a little bit far from the, the side. So I think, uh, how do you expect the, the initial cost? Because when you propose things like this, I'm, I'm sure you might have uh, uh, got some uh, some kind of objections to when you propose these things for the uh, implementing or government or policy makers. So I think uh, there, I expect there will be some kind of objection. So how do you try to convince them or how, how do they accept these things? I mean, to date, um, this is, I mean, this is a good point. The, the point is how do you kickstart something? How do you inject the, the cost needed to start doing something differently. Um, for the FSC and the MSC, we, we put up the money. We went out, we raised the money, and we paid for investigating how to do the certification. Uh, we paid for uh, the early parts of that. The whole point behind these things is that eventually they they should pay for themselves, and now FSC, MSC are completely independent. Um, we can, and you know, we, we sit down, as I said, power of persuasion, we sit down with the industry. You know, we sit down with the timber companies, and we say, look, if you join this scheme, you will be able to sell your timber better than companies that are not certified, okay? I'm going to move away because the, the microphone is reverberating a little bit with that. Um, so we, 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 we're looking at how uh, sustainable behavior can give you a market edge. Uh, and so what we found is that, is that when we first started with FSC, it was really difficult. Nobody believed us, right? And they said, come on, you've got to get the producers, you've got to get the consumers, you've got to get the middlemen, right? That's why it took us 20 years. When we came to the, to the MSC, people saw the FSC working, and so companies were more likely to join in. And in fact, the MSC, the reason the MSC got off the ground was for Unilever. You've probably all heard of Unilever, the company that makes, all again, all these household products that we use. Um, and Unilever in the 90s was the world's largest commercial consumer of fish. They had all sorts of fish products, Findus foods and things like that came out, of, uh, came out of Unilever. And Unilever came to WWF and they said, look, our fish business is going to go bankrupt if the fish stocks continue to decline. WWF, you know fish stocks. What can we do together? So a lot of the early part of MSC was actually paid for by Unilever. That's what kick-started that. Today, when we're working with the, with the um, oil palm industry, uh, there is uh, very little money required from WWF, uh, but we're able to get the oil palm companies to sit together. And what companies want in the world they don't necessarily want subsidies, they just want a level playing field, right? 
that if I'm going to make a sacrifice and no longer use arsenic to poison my old trees and burn them, right? If I'm going to start recycling those old trees for biomass and energy production, I want everybody else to do that. It's going to cost me a little bit. It might cost me 3% of my profit. But so long as everybody else is costing 3% of their profit, I'm okay with that. I'll do with 97% of my profit. So we're able to use power of persuasion these days for companies to get involved. So actually lack of money is not the problem. It's, it's the political will. It's getting companies over that hurdle and getting them confident to, to do what they're doing. It's also getting the consumers, because all of this is only as good as whether people are going to buy the stuff at the end of the day, getting consumers to be able to uh, consume properly. So um, for us, we also work hard with the general public, doing education, making the right choices. Uh, but we also work with retailers. Um, what's that big supermarket chain in the US, the biggest one? Walmart, Walmart thank you. <laughs> You'd think I'd know that, wouldn't you? Um, uh, Walmart uh, uh, are now committed to stocking MSC fish, right? In oh, you're in Japan, right? So Eon, Eon supermarket chain, are committed to buying only uh, MSC certified fish. And if we can get the big retailers to create that demand, they can put pressure upstream on their suppliers, right, uh, to supply them with sustainable products. And if you go to the supermarket, right now you go to the supermarket, you have to make difficult choices. You've got to look at the product and say, well, has this got the logo or has that got the logo? How do I do it? Um, if supermarkets are only going to stock sustainably produced products, then you don't have to make those decisions. The decisions are already made for you. So these are the ways, these are the ways that we go in it. But it all depends on there being a market advantage. It all, all, always depends upon that market demand. Just one more question, just it's related. Uh, how about the, the feedback you get from the governments, from the administration, from the policy makers? Of course, as you said, with the companies, are, you can persuade them, you can advertise them, and in fact, you can give them like uh, uh, some kind of evidence from experience, or maybe like you said, they will take a risk, like they are investors, so they have some kind of calculation and make uh, uh, some kind of uh, perspective, and then they, they can take the risk. But how about a government making policy? How do you make uh, your discussion with government? Like, the other uh, day, I had a conference from WHO person in uh, uh, Asia region, uh, Asia Pacific region. He said that uh, the the biggest battle we find is to make a discussion with policymakers. So it's always difficult to 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 convince them and to implement new ideas. So how do you uh, uh, get a discussion with them? Um, that can be very variable. The, uh, for things like certification, FSC, MSC, governments really don't care. Oh, it's a good thing. It's all right, but I'm not going to necessarily push it. I'm certainly not going to subsidize it. But if this, if this is what the companies want to do, let them do it. You know, that's, that's in the private sector domain. Um, what comes trickier is if we want the European Union to give a, an import tax break to FSC timber as opposed to non-certified timber, right? So timber that's coming into the EU from the tropics, uh, the EU should be able to favor tax-wise and import duty-wise uh, certified timber. They won't do that. They don't like that kind of discrimination. And the entire WTO system is set up to avoid that kind of discrimination. So when it comes to creating favorable marketplaces uh, for sustainable, sustainably produced products, probably the WTO is the biggest obstacle that we face right now. And the, what's the WTO? It's a coalition of governments. Um, the tough thing can come uh, like the, 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 the Mekong story. Uh, because the government of Laos is right now being considering a huge dam in Laos for electricity production. 
which is going to have a grave effect upon the entire rest of the downstream. And they just wouldn't listen. We lobbied the governments of Cambodia uh, and Vietnam to put pressure on the Laos government to reconsider that scheme. And so, because, because Vietnam and Cambodia were going to suffer because of the impact on the, uh, on the Mekong River by a country upstream. So we can, we can play politi political games like that. And our, our political, our policy work is often about getting one country to put pressure on another country to get the result, uh, to get the result that you want. Um, so a lot of it is very issue specific, whether governments are good or, or not, you know. Trying to persuade the Japanese government not to go whaling every year is a pretty tough one right now. Uh, but we can, you know, we can work with the governments of the UK and Australia and America to put more and more pressure, increasing pressure on Japan uh, not, to, not to hunt whales. Um, so it's, it is very variable. Okay, is there more questions? Yeah. But. Hi, Thorstein Hi. from Norway, Oslo, Norway. Uh, I, I just want to continue on the, the labeling <laughs> discussion and how you feel about the, the jungle of labels going on. You know, you have the fair trade, you have the FSC, you have marine stewardship, there is the eco brands, and it's Rainforest Alliance going on, you end up with a um, quite big bunch. And it's, like if you want to do a good consumption, it's, it's in a way even hard to figure out which one you want to choose. So yeah. no, it, I, I agree uh, uh, and I sympathize. And one of the things that we found, because the FSC and the MSC have, have proved to be reasonably successful, is that you then get imitation brands. And you get imitation brands that you don't know the standards of. Uh, we do what we can to, um, uh, to stay on top of that. We try and inform consumers, you know, which of these labels is, in our opinion, uh, uh, the better one. But you can't really control that. And this is where the work with the retailers takes on even more importance uh, because the retailers are, um, are critical as to what appears in front of the consumer. But since you're from Norway, um, there is uh, a particularly popular in Scandinavia a timber certification scheme called the Pan-European Forest Certification System. So it's the PEFC. It almost sounds the same. And when the PEFC first came up, uh, actually promoted by Finnish interests and Finnish for foresters, um, it was way below the standard of the FSC. Uh, and we simply had to sit down at the negotiation table uh, to say, look, come on, if you can up your game, if you can get as good as the FSC, then we'll promote your label also. Um, we threatened them with a campaign. <laughs> if, if they didn't talk to us, you know, that we would go out and condemn the brand in public. Um, and over a period of maybe four years, it worked. And now uh, PEFC and FSC are very, very closely, uh, very, very closely aligned. And even, you know, when I move around here in Switzerland, I'll come to a forest that's got a label uh, on it that says we're sustainably managed, we're certified by both FSC and PEFC. Um, but it can be very confusing. We're working on, we're working on a system uh, where we should all be able to reach into our pockets and, and, and pull out. That's interesting. Where's my cell phone? Uh, pull out our smartphones, right, and scan a barcode and have that barcode tell you on your cell phone uh, what, is your, uh, what is the origin of that, uh, of that product. Um, there is a scheme in the US that does that. I can't remember what it's called, but of the people who've adopted that scheme in the US, it's been a, it's been a pilot, um, something like uh, people who've signed up for the scheme, something like 60% of the people actually then use it when they're shopping. 
And of those 60%, 90% change their minds and buy a different product when they see what comes up on their, their information. The good guy, that's it, exactly, thank you. Um, and that is a really powerful tool, right? You imagine companies thinking, my God, if all those people are out there checking up on me like this, uh, I better be, I better be, I better be good. So we're looking at how could we uh, uh, amplify that in some way around the world. The good guide is available at the moment only for a few, only for a few commodities, uh, and only in the U.S. But if we could make that more wide, but of course, it demands more consumer awareness and more consumer effort uh, to make those decisions. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, we are already running late, but is there one last question, maybe? Yeah. Hello, I'm Rihanna from Australia. Um, a lot of the things that you've spoken about have kind of been um, continuing um, the rate of, I guess, our behaviours and that kind of thing, but... Um, trying to do it more sustainably, so doing it within a sustainable yield and all that kind of thing. So is there much in terms of um, WWF sort of going the other way, sort of trying to reverse some of the um, damage, like, say, with the palm oil plantations, like restoring um, the forests and that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, we do have a forest restoration project, but that is where... Who asked me the comments about lobbying with governments? That is where governments really kick in. We don't, if we're looking at forest restoration, and forest restoration is important where forests have been damaged, and it's, it's good for several reasons. It stabilizes soil, so it prevents erosion. It can, it can for, forested hillsides soak up water like a sponge when it rains, and they release water uh, more slowly later on. So it keeps rivers running reliably, and it prevents that drought and flood uh, cycle that, that one can get into. And of course, increasingly, those trees, whilst they're growing, are absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So, you know, there's a carbon uh, climate change advantage here. But it's got to be done on a huge scale. It's got to be done on a huge scale. Uh, the Norwegian government has come up with funding uh, for climate in a program called RED, reducing emissions from forest degradation and deforestation or something like that, um, uh, which will actually subsidize this kind of, pay for this kind of work. Um, and uh, I think more of it will come in future. Uh, but as an organization, it's the sort of thing that we encourage from a, a lobbying point of view. We just don't have the capacity to put 2,000 people on the ground in a mountain range planting trees. You know, it, it's a much bigger operation than we can deal with. Okay, so unfortunately we have to stop here because uh, there's an another conference after. But thanks again, Mr. Hales, for presenting this. I think we can thank him one more time. <laughs>